welcome to today's webinar, which is on ensemble gene annotation for clinical genomics. My name is Emily Perry, and I'm joined by uh, my colleague, Joanella um, Morales. Um, so what we're going to cover, I'm going to talk about gene annotation in ensemble, and I'm going to talk about the GenCode project. And then um, Joanella is going to tell us about the main project, which is our collaboration with RefSeq, and also about TARC, which is um, a tool which is currently in beta, but it allows you to compare um, transcripts between Ensemble and between um, RefSeq um, and different versions. And then finally, I'll talk about how you can annotate variants um, using the Ensemble Variant Effect Predictor, or VEP. So um, why, do we, why do we need genome browsers? Well, genomes in themselves are, are massive and they are produced at a phenomenal rate um, these days. The first genome to be sequenced was a phage um, by Fred Sanger back in 1977, and it was 5 KB, and this was a huge deal. The human genome was finished, very much in inverted commas, um, in 2004. Um, but we know that it's not actually finished. It's had many, many improvements done on the genome um, since then. And now with projects such as the Vertebrate Genomes Project, um, we're producing large numbers of, of genomes from different species. Meanwhile, other, other things such as um, Nomad and um, Thousand Genomes and things show us the large numbers of genomes that we might get from a single species by, by sequencing individuals. And when we sequence genomes, this is our data. It's a series of letters. It's completely meaningless. Um, and so genome browsers are one of the ways that we try and make this make sense. So what Ensemble does is we annotate genomes. We map genomic um, features from genome sequences, such as genes and variants and things, onto the genome. We add value to the resource. So we bring together things from different sources. So we wouldn't just have a genetic variant. We would then bring in population data and citation data and phenotype data that is mapped onto that genetic variant. So we're bringing together lots of different kinds of data into one place. Um, and Ensemble is, is one of many um, publicly available genome browsers, um, online genome browsers. So uh, there's UCSC Genome Browser, um, NTBI have, have their own genome browser. You also have sort of offline genome browsers as well, like IGV, and they all work slightly differently um, and have different strengths and weaknesses. So what we have in Ensemble is what we call gene builds for, for 200 species. We compare all the genes to each other. We produce what we call a regulatory build, comparing, um, looking for features such as promoters and enhancers. We have ways to look at variation data um, and a tool called the VEP. We allow you to display your own data. We allow you to export tables of data using Biomart. We also have programmatic access. We have APIs, um, and we are completely open source. Um, and you can access the data at different scales. You can access genes and variants and things on a one-by-one -one basis using the browser. And we'll talk a bit in this webinar about some of the ways that you can look um, at genes one-by-one -one and some of the things you might be looking for in genes um, when you're working from a clinical perspective. You can also download whole um, genome data. We have an FTP site. Um, so if you were doing things like variant calling at a genome-wide scale, you could download a reference genome um, from us. And then we have um, in between things. So we're going to look at VEP today, which allows you to look at, at groups of genetic variants um, and also single genetic variants and understand how they affect genes. Biomart allows you to look at groups as does um, the REST API, and you can have flexible access as well via our, our Perl API and MySQL database. An important thing to know about Ensemble is that we have a release cycle. So every three months, we put out all our new data and all our new tools. So over the course of this time period, we will have new and updated genome assemblies and gene sets. We will update the software. We will compare all our new genes and genomes. We will update the, the data that we pull in from elsewhere, including the variation data. And we may update our interfaces um, so that they reflect the new data types. So the next release we are hoping is going to come by the end of the month. That will be release 98. And we're currently on release 97. So this is what genes look like. Um, in Ensemble. So what we can see here, there's quite a lot of information um, in this view. If you look at a region view, 
um, you will see genes that look like this. So we have, um, we can see the structure of the, the transcripts of the genes. So one, one feature of, of um, ensemble genes is they do have a lot of transcripts. Um, so what we're looking at is, is multiple transcripts of, of a few different genes here. Um, so we have coding exons of transcripts we display as colored blocks. Non-coding exons we display as, as empty blocks. Um, introns are displayed as the, the lines um, connecting the, the exons together. And on a forward strand gene, these are shown pointing upwards. On a reverse strand gene, these are shown pointing downwards. And um, there's actually two other things that indicate the strand of um, a gene. So this blue contig here represents the genome. These genes up here are all forward strand, and this gene down here below the contig is reverse strand. So that's another way. And a third way is actually this little arrow here, which indicates the direction of transcription. So we've got transcribing this way, and we've got transcribing this way. We also can see the biotypes of the different transcripts. Um, so we have protein coding transcripts are shown in red or gold. And the gold ones are what we call merged transcripts. And I'll explain what that means in a moment. Uh, coding genes can have non-coding transcripts and these are shown in blue. Excuse me. Um, whereas non-coding um, gene transcripts are shown in this kind of gray purple color. So the golden transcripts are identical um, annotation between the two different methods that we use. Um, and we consider th these to be quite high confidence and quality. Um, so the two methods we use are automatic annotation um, and manual annotation. So we do the automatic annotation for every um, species in the database. The manual annotation is done for a, a smaller subset. Um, so the automatic annotation uses a pipeline. Um, so we use real biological data. We plot sequences of proteins and cDNAs onto the genome, um, which is done using sequence matching. The sort of misconception that many people have when they hear this phrase automatic annotation is that we're going to be just looking for open reading frames um, in the genome. Now, this is something that's called ab initio prediction, and it is done um, in certain circumstances with certain kinds of species, but it's not something that is done by ensemble. All of our gene predictions have experimental biological data behind them. So the data we're using um, comes from the INSDC, the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Consortium, which consists of the ENA, who are based here at the EBI, GenBank um, and DDBJ. And we get cDNAs, express sequence tags, and also RNA-seq data from them. We also use protein um, database uh, data, uh, which we get from Uniprot. So we use both the SwissProt manually curated proteins and the Tremble unreviewed translations. Um, we can't always get a lot of species specific data um, for, for a lot of species. So um, for many species, we use homology. Um, so we predict genes in, for example, chimp by mapping human proteins and tDNAs onto the chimp genome. Manual gene annotation is very, very different. Um, it is done by a person rather than a computer. Um, it is genome wide, so we have a complete um, pass of the human and the mouse databases. Um, we don't have such complete data um, for zebrafish and for rat, but there is quite significant manual gene annotation for these. We use data from loads of different sources for this. So instead of just mapping on the sequence data, we can take into account other kinds of databases. So we would use similar kinds of data that we use for the automatic annotation, such as the INSDC database and RNA-seq data. But then you can also take into account um, things like known intron data, CAGE, um, polyaseq, um, for looking at the, the, the start and, and end of transcription. You can use mass spec for looking at protein data. And you can also take into account publications. Manual and automatic annotation is, is very different. Um, manual annotation tends to be much more comprehensive. You get a lot more transcripts per gene. And these can sometimes be, have quite minimal evidence supporting them, but that evidence is strong. Um, whereas for, for automatic annotation, um, there may be 
more evidence, but it, it's there's no indication of how strong that evidence is. Um, and there'll be more genes overall, and this is particularly applies to, to non-coding transcripts and non-coding genes. There are a lot more biotypes that can be annotated through manual annotation um, because there's a lot of biological understanding that needs to be taken into account when assigning some of these. Um, and it can be more accurate for more difficult to annotate features um, such as untranslated regions, splice sites, single exon transcripts, and, and genes that, that don't fall into our, our normal understanding of genes, such as immunoglobulins, um, which undergo somatic recombination. There is a sort of added thing of, of gen code. So gen code is the ensemble human and mouse genes. Um, so this was actually a Originally, we were doing the annotation like this, where we had the manual annotation, the automatic annotation, and we merged it together. Um, and then this got picked up by, by the GenCode Consortium, who then added on extra um, quality control and checks on it, um, which makes this, this um, extra special data set. And it is the default gene set by use, used by a number of major projects. Um, some of which are, are listed here. So we've got things um, like variant calling projects such as NOMAD, um, things like um, um, epigenomic projects such as Roadmap and Blueprint, um, and um, other kinds of expression projects like GTEx and um, Human Cell Atlas. So the GenCode Consortium is um, the ensemble um, and the, the Havana. Um, manual and, and computational gene annotation with this added um, input of information, input of quality control from a number of different institutes um, which are listed here, which come together to make this gene set. So I'm going to hand over to Joanella now, who's going to talk about the matched annotation from NCBI and Emble EBI project. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joanella Morales, and I'm a project manager here at Emble EBI. And what I'd like to do with the few minutes that I have this afternoon is talk to about two different um, initiatives. One is the main matched annotation from NCBI and Emble EBI, and the TARC project, which is a tool that we have been uh, recently developing here within Ensemble. And so Emily has been talking about the gen code, the ensemble gen code set, which is one of the sources of transcript annotation. But the other source is the RefSeq set. Now these two are, um, okay, so I was just saying that there are two sources of transcript annotation. One is the NCBI, the RefSeq set at the NCBI, and the other one is the ensemble gen code set that Emily has been talking about. Now these two sets are complementary but they're not identical, they are distinct. And so the NCBI set produces NMs and XMs. The NMs are the manually annotated transcripts and the XMs are automatically produced. Now these, the RefSeq transcripts don't need to match the primary reference assembly. They do represent a prevalent standard allele, but it's not always the reference. And most of the clinical annotation so far has predominantly been done using the RefSeq transcripts. Now the ensemble gen code, these are the ENSTs that Emily has been mentioning, and they are compared to the RefSeq set, there are more manually reviewed transcripts in the ensemble set. And the ensemble set must match the primary reference assembly. And on average, when you compare the two, there are more ensemble transcripts per gene compared to how many RefSeqs there are per gene. And increasingly so, the ensemble gen code set is a reference set for these larger scale projects such as Nomad, GTEx, Decipher, and, and so forth. Now, why have these two groups come together to define a joint representative transcript set? Well, primarily because we think it's important to standardize transcript annotation across genomics browsers and resources. So for example, VEP, Nomad, GTEx, all of these resources have their own default or canonical, as, as, as you, if you will, and they're not all the same. And so what that means is that if you're using more than one resource, it's a little bit confusing um, because the, the canonical might be different between the sets that you're, between the, the browsers that you're using. Similarly, um, we are interested in helping the community find 
a transcript that captures the most information about each protein coding gene. So rather than this default or canonical be the first one or the longest one or the one that has the most exons, we want to produce a set that would allow these browsers or resources to use the one that captures the most information about the locus. We also think this is particularly useful for standardizing clinical reporting. So we know that the differences in annotation between the RefSeq set and the ensemble set make it, makes it difficult to exchange data between the two. So we know that HGVS, for example, the expressions require reporting a variant using a transcript. And often these are confused. Um, so it's thought that these transcripts are synonymous <coughs> or identical when in reality they might not be. And that, of course, can cause confusion, especially when trying to interpret the impact of the variant. And finally, for those members of the community who are more interested in doing comparative or evolutionary genomics, we think it's really useful to have one transcript per gene that can be used as a starting point for these analyses. So for all these reasons, and, and before I move on, I wanted just one big caveat, please. When doing clinical interpretation, all transcripts and all sources should be considered. So we, we are not saying by defining one canonical or one representative, we're not saying that that is the only one that should be used for clinical interpretation. Similarly, we're not saying that all of biology can, can be simplified to this one transcript. What we're saying is for simplifying and for standardizing, it is useful to pick one, and that is what we have done. So what exactly is MAIN? So MAIN stands for Matched Annotation from the NCBI and EMBL EBI. And the goal is very simple. Here we are creating a transcript set that's, that has the following attributes. It first of all must match GRCH38. And second, it must be a pairing of a RefSeq and its corresponding ENST, but these are 100% identical at the five prime, at the CDS level, and at the three prime UTR level. So these are synonymous transcripts. Second, any transcript in the main set must be well-supported, well-expressed, well-conserved, and representative of biology at that locus. So we're doing this project in two phases. The first phase is what we're calling the main select phase, where we are finding one transcript for each protein coding locus, and the goal is to use it as the default across resources and browsers. But we're also going through a second phase called the main plus phase, where we will identify additional well-supported transcripts that might be of particular interest, for example, for clinical reporting. Now, how have we gone about selecting the select? So this, this is primarily an automated approach with, and it has a layer of manual review on top. So this means that the first step was to build independent pipelines to select a transcript some, from each set. So that means that RefSeq at the NCBI, they built their pipeline and the ensemble team here at EMBL EBI, they built their own pipeline. And you can see here the different components that went into each pipeline, and you can see that they're very similar. What's slightly different, perhaps, are the weightings that each one, that these components were given. So for instance, for the RefSeq pipeline, perhaps expression was more predominant, whereas for the ensemble pipeline, the length of a transcript had a weight or um, um, a higher weight given to it. But the idea was that these pipelines would then, uh, we, we would pick a, a transcript from each set, and then we, we would compare. So using this diagram here, I'm, I'm showing you that the first step is to select. So we have these two sets, the RefSeq set and the Ensemble GenCode set. We've got these pipelines that we picked one. We then compared the output of the pipelines. And if they were the, the same model, we, we then reviewed and compared. And we then went through a process of matching where we mostly changed the UTR so that we would have identity at the five prime at the CDS and at the five prime at the three prime end. And once all of that was achieved, the, the transcript would then go into the main select set. Now, when we first run the pipelines and compare the outputs, the first bin we found was the one that we all had hoped for. This is the identical bin where the pipelines had selected identical transcripts on each set. 
Unfortunately, we also found two other sets. We found the second set, which uh, were, were the pipeline selected the same set, the same CDS, but different UTRs, either the different UTR length or a different splicing pattern. And yet a third set where the pipelines pick completely different CDSs with or without changes in the UTR. Of course, the first thing that we noticed was that although we wanted bin one, what we got the most of was bin two. The majority of cases were these where the pipelines had picked the same CDS but different UTRs. Then we also saw um, a number of genes in the bin and bin three, and we noticed that these were very complex loci where there were an, perhaps annotation differences between the, the RefSeq set and the ensemble set. And also these were ones that were where there was a lot of alternative splicing, quite extensive. So making a choice at a, a, using a pipeline was quite, quite difficult. Because the, the majority of cases were in bin two, that's, that's the first bin we targeted. We focused on reducing that number. Again, these are the ones where the pipelines picked the same CDS, but different UTRs. So the first step was to define rules so that we could jointly define the extent of the UTRs. And we came up with a concept of the longest strong, which I will, I will explain in, in a minute. Um, but then once we defined these rules, we then trimmed or extended the ends using a computational approach. So I'm just going to briefly show you how this concept of the longest strong works uh, at the five prime end. Here you can see uh, using the Ensemble Genome Browser, an example of the gene K and G1. At the top, you can see the NM. In the middle, you can see the ENSTs. Um, here you can see the RNA-seq data. And at the bottom, importantly for the pi prime end, you can see the CAGE data. Now, CAGE stands for CAP Analysis of Gene Expression, developed in Japan. And it's basically a way to quantify the abundance of RNAs that have a particular start site. So if you go by peak size, you can see that the strongest peak is, is the one that there are numerous start sites there, but it's not necessarily representative of what's happening. There's a lot of RNA sig RNA seq signal that is lost. If you go with the longest, then you capture all the RNA seq signal, but then you can see that it is quite a rare event that there will be a start site here. So therefore, we decided to go with the longest strong, which is a, a long enough start site that captures a significant amount of, of, of transcription start sites. So once we defined that, then that became the start site for this, for this particular um, gene. And the concept was done across the genome uh, for using an algorithm to automate the, the, the end. And here you can see the similar example with a three prime end using the NCBI's um, genome data viewer, their browser. Again, similar kinds of uh, layout and data. And again, you can see that if you go for the longest, you, you miss out on a lot of RNA-seq and other data. So you go for the longest strong, which captures quite a few three prime ends, but also um, it, it is more representative of what's happening at that locus. So that's what we did. And once we completed that approach, we were able to reduce that second bin quite significantly. However, we, will, we were still left with a third um, bin. This is the one where the pipelines pick completely different CDSs. And for this, our approach was first to improve our pipelines. We realized that if we could tweak our pipelines and perhaps make them more similar to each other, then we might be able to select similar, similar CDSs. However, what we realized that was that even after improving the pipelines, there, was a, there were still a number of genes that couldn't be resolved, and so those are now undergoing manual curation. An important thing to point out here is that this is indeed our hardest bin. This is the one that includes cases where actually there is no right answer. Either one of the, of the two transcripts are both valid, expressed, conserved, could have been selected, and this is, this is just biology for a number of loci across the genome. So in those cases, we just have to pick one and we manually review, we discuss, and then we go with one. And, and that is the main select for these, for these complicated genes. So where are we right now? What's our current status? So by the end of September, when, when the next ensemble release is released, we will have released 
main select transcripts for about 67% across the genome. And that release will be version 0.6 and all those genes will be available. The, the, refs, the main select will be available on browsers and on the FTP site. In addition, we have identified an additional 4% that are um, main select, but will be released only via a dedicated track cup. And those will also be, be available hopefully by the end of, of the month. Our goal is to increase to 75 to 80% 80, 80 coverage by the end of the year, with the ultimate goal, of course, of achieving genome-wide coverage. And we're hoping to achieve that by 2020. Of course, don't quote me, here is another caveat. The closer we get to that genome-wide coverage, the more difficult this process will be because, well, there are numerous complex loci where annotation, it, it's not just a matter of selecting, it's also a matter of updating the annotation, refining it, discussing, and then finally selecting one. So that that is, is we fully expect that there will be some genes that will be quite tricky um, to complete. So for clinical genes, of course, we know that for, for the clinical community, this, this, this set of transcript is really, really useful. So we're working very closely with clinical partners here in the UK through the UK-based Transforming Genomic Medicine Initiative, or TGMI, but we're also consulting with our colleagues in the ClinGen um, group in the US. And the goal here, of course, is to ensure that genes that we know have a high gene disease validity, that those are prioritized in all our efforts, both automated and also all our manual curation. Um, and then in addition, this helps us take into account clinical information when we make our decisions. So if we know the tissue of importance for a particular gene or the developmental stage, then that can, can help our decision when it's time to pick a transcript. So in terms of coverage of the clinical genes, I would say it's about on par with what we're doing genome-wide. Approximately, depending on, on the list that you check, whether it's a, the TGMI's list or the ClinGen list, you get anywhere between 71% to 74% coverage. And of course, again, the goal there is to achieve 100% because we know for these genes, this is, is really critical. Now, how do you access the main? Well, Ensemble is, is your first point here. I'm showing the browser. And here I'm showing that you can find the main with a, as a flag here on the transcript table. At the moment, you can see the 0.5, but as I said, by the end of the month, you'll have the main select version 0.6. And also you can see here, and I'm marking here in red, you can see that there is a flag in the summary that indicates that for this gene, there's at least one transcript that has an identical match within the RefSeq set. And that transcript, of course, is the one listed here in the RefSeq match column. You can also find the main in the NCBI browser. Down here, you can see um, version 0.6. And in the UCSC browser, you can also see um, the main set. And, and uh, importantly, highlighting, you can very clearly see that these are identical transcripts that can be used synonymously. If you are interested in visualizing all the main or finding the long list of genes that have a main select, you can come to the NCBI's FTP site and follow this link. And here I'm showing you both releases are, are available. And you can also see that if you go to this particular file, you, you will see a summary with all the genes and all the identifiers um, that are main select. Now I shouldn't move on until I, I go through some of the limitations of this project. By definition, main select requires picking one transcript. So that means that by definition, the main select cannot capture all the biological complexity at a locus. So that means that, again, by definition, some transcripts are excluded. It's also the case that in some cases, the transcripts that are excluded are as valid as the main select in any metric. So they're as conserved, expressed, uh, representative, but of course we are selecting one, and that means that these other really valid transcripts are excluded. They are still an ensemble or in RefSeq, and they are equally important, but in terms of, of identifying one, they, they had to be excluded. It also, also for, for this project, we know that many highly supported transcripts 
might might show a tissue specificity or might might show a, a particular pattern or, of expression and clearly if you're selecting one transcript you cannot show that complexity in the main set and finally there are just gaps in data so at the moment the main select represents a snapshot based on the data we currently have so for some genes there's just not enough data the conservation is 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 tricky the utrs are difficult and so what we're doing is selecting one that is the best choice given the data we have now so this means that select is fairly stable but not entirely stable because if new data is uncovered that that requires us to change our current select to a different transcript we we will do so in terms of next step, obviously the first thing to do is to get us to 100% for select, but we're also now beginning to think about main plus. We are starting to, again, plus is just an extension of select where we identify a few other transcripts that are of interest. For example, we know that there are some genes that, that for reporting you need more than one transcript. So we might, one would be the select and the other one might go in plus, for example. And these transcripts need to be similar to select in that they must match 38 and they must represent a pairing of a RefSeq and the ENST. The current status is, as I said, we're just currently reviewing genes, thinking about what would go in plus, and we're aiming to beginning releasing some in 2020. So in summary, NCBI and EBI are working together. We are reviewing annotation to produce a high, a set of high value transcripts these will match 38 and will match each other. Um, and first we are defining one, that's the select. And then eventually we will add a few others that are of particular interest. This is, we, we want as much feedback as we can get on this. So if you have any questions, please, you can email us at mainhelp at ebi.ac.uk, or you can see um, here, you can see all the people who are working on this project quite a few people um, and, and, and funding from different sources. Again, if you have any questions, please contact us at mainhelp at ebi.ac.uk. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talk about a new tool that we're developing in Ensemble to, to really cope with all the different transcripts that we have. So Emily talked about the GenCode set. I mentioned the RefSeq set. Now we're talking about main select, main plus all of these transcripts also have versions so how do we deal with this complexity well one tool that we're, we're building is this TARC or transcript archive i'm emphasizing that this is still under development that's why it's a beta it's beta TARC right now but you can go to that link and play with it it's it's good enough that you can play with it and give us give us some feedback so why? What is TARC and why do we need it? Well, TARC is really a repository of all past and present transcript from all, all sources. The goal here is to ensure full transparency about transcripts and the changes they've undergone over time. We also want the user to be able to compare transcripts from all these different resources, different versions and identifiers. And then very importantly, we want to ensure that transcripts that were used in a historical clinical report, that those are available in perpetuity. It, that is really critical. So if, if a transcript was used at, for a clinical report, say 10 years ago, with, a, with an, a, a, a transcript that has now updated, we want for anybody looking at the report to be able to find the old transcript, to find the new transcript, and to know how that transcript has changed over time. So why do we need TARC? This is just an illustration. I've already talked about this. There are versions, there are sources, there are releases, and, and the, especially in the clinical context, the, where your variant sits with respect to your genome, that doesn't change. And we need to be able to make sure that that information is, is accurate and, and it is captured um, up over time. And we need to be able to do that by by capturing the, the information in versions and by being able to find how these transcripts have changed. We don't want for there to be confusion because that especially can have an impact in terms of understanding the significance of a variant and that would be very detrimental. So we want to make sure 
our collaborators, our users know which variant, which um, transcript is being used and how that transcript is changing over time. So how does TARC work? This illustrates it here. We've got data from different sources, from perhaps different releases represented by these different databases. We, bring, we are bringing them all together into one big archive called TARC. And then we add a layer of functionality so you can store, search, and compare between transcripts. So here are the main functionalities. We want to store an archive. We want to be able to search and retrieve transcripts. You can search by gene symbol or by identifier. You can also search by looking through an overlapping genomic region, or if all you have is an HGBS expression, for example, for a variant, you might be able to find all the transcripts that overlap this particular position. And then we want for you to be able to find the transcripts that you care about and compare them and know how they're different. So comparing transcripts from different sources, let's say RefSeq versus Ensemble, or from different assemblies, if you're still on 37 and you want to move to 38, you would know how to do that, how these transcripts differ, and from different releases. We're about to release 98. If you want to compare 96 or 97 to 98, you should be able to do that using TARC. So again, TARC is under construction, but if you follow this link, you will get to this um, page and you can access TARC data using two, two different ways. You can do it through a REST API, or you can use it, do it through the web version. For those of you technologically savvy, um, you can go in, or computationally savvy, you can go in, and, and I'm giving you here the REST API endpoints, but feel free, please, to go in and test all of this and give us feedback to, 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 to help us know how much, inf if you can get the information and, and how helpful it is. I'm going to focus here though on the web version because we know that quite a few of our collaborators are keen on, on using this on a, on a web format. Now, I'm going to use the screenshots, uh, but of course, if, the, if there is time, I, I can also, I can also uh, walk you through a demo. So in terms of when you can search, you can search using any number of, of features, either the gene symbol or the identifier. But in this case, I'm showing I've done a search using the gene symbol. And your first output is just a list of, of transcripts, all the transcripts from the past and the present and all the different versions. For here, you can copy your list, download it, PDF it. If you're just interested, I want to know everything about this gene. Um, you, can, you can access that using these controls here. But you can also see that we have information about different assemblies, so you can see what's in 38 and what's in 37. You can see which ones are from Ensemble and which ones are from RefSeq. You can also see the different releases, so you have data from 96 or 97 and so forth. And importantly, linked to the previous talk I, I just gave, you can see which transcripts are in your main select set with their identifiers. Now, if now you're interested in comparing transcripts, you would select one as your T1, you would select the other one as your T2, and you would just click compare. That would take you to your compare transcripts page. And here, this, this page is slightly busy, so I'm just gonna quickly walk you through it, but you can see that the top panel gives you information about how the, tra the transcripts compared in terms of transcript information. So here you would compare the number of exons. You can see um, the whole cDNA sequence and, and, and how those two compare. If you see a green check, that means that they match. If you see a red cross, that means that there's a difference. The second panel gives you information at the gene level. So here, for example, this would be really useful if your gene symbol has changed from one release to the next, for example. The third panel gives you information about the CDS and the protein. So here, again, you would be able to see if there are differences, say, at the 5' UTR, at the CDS level, at the 3' UTR, or at the protein sequence level. In this example, for, for example, the CDS hasn't changed, the protein hasn't changed, but you can see that the 5' and the 3' ends have changed. If now you're interested in knowing exactly what the change is, you can go to your exon panel. And now here you can see that at least for the five prime end, that change is within the first exon. 
And if that is not enough information and you want to be more granular and, and comparing, you can then either download your FASTA file and, and do with it what, what you would like, or you can do an alignment of the two transcripts and that would give you a very clear indication of what exactly is different. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the particular transcript, of course, you can click on this on the identifiers and that would take you to a transcript history page. The top panel just gives you information about the current version, in this case, version eight. It tells you information about if there's a main select and it links out to other useful resources. But the bottom panel gives you more of the history of the transcript. So you can see everything from version three to version eight, it gives you information about the assembly and the release. And then if you're interested in comparing, you would just compare between the transcripts. Now, obviously I said this is still under construction and that's because we are working on one additional feature which allows you to compare multiple transcripts. So going back to this one where you had the history with your multi-transcript comparison, you would be able to compare all of these transcripts and know exactly what has changed over time. We're currently testing. So if you are interested in this and would like to test it, you can contact me at this email here. This is my email address and you can, I'm happy to put you on our user testing list or I'm happy to um, get feedback via email. Most of the user testing has been done using tools like Zoom, for example, so anybody can participate in the testing. So please feel free to contact me. So in summary, we're producing an archive. We are trying to track changes over time. We want our, our community collaborators to be able to retrieve any transcripts of interest and then to compare them so they can make a better, better use. Here are all the people in Ensemble, but especially Prem and Beth, who are both working um, on this project. And with that, I shall pass it back to Emily so that she can um, do the remaining bit of the presentation. Oh, I'm just sat on the top of the cable here. Right. Um, okay. Let's get past Joanna's slides. Find my own. Oh, here we go. So um, we're talking a lot about about genes, and obviously in the um, well, we're talking about um, genes. We're talking. When we're talking in the, the clinic, we're talking about genetic variation, um, and Jo and Ella has, has spoken a lot about the importance of of understanding which um, transcript you're working with in order to to interpret the effects um, of genetic variants. So um, I want to talk a bit about the Ensemble VEP, which stands for Variant Effect Predictor, um, and this is a tool to predict and annotate the functional consequences of variants. So if you've done things like large-scale variant calling, um, you can then run the VEP in order to find out information about the genes that are affected. And so you can elucidate the, the um, etiology of, of the disease. Um, so you would put your variant um, data into the VEP. This would combine with the, the data in Ensemble in order to give you information about the affected genes and transcripts and proteins, um, the pathogenicity of the variant, the frequency data, the um, regulatory consequences, splicing consequences, and also literature that might already mention the, the variants. So VEP can take input in a, a number of different formats. You can put in kind of straight coordinates. Um, We've mentioned HGBS notation, so this is where you express a variant in terms of the 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 um, the transcript or the protein that affects. Um, but also, it can be in in the context of the the genome as well. So I've given a few examples there. Um, VCF format, um, which would be the standard format you would get out if you did something like whole genome variant calling, um, lists of variant IDs, and also the new Speedy format, which is provided by um, dbSNP. And the VEP will allow you to predict consequences. So it can give you the consequences on Ensemble and RefSeq genes, and also both of them at once. Um, there's this GenCode basic, which is like a reduced set of the Ensemble GenCode genes. 
you can find out if your variant overlaps regulatory regions, which are predicted um, from data from ENCODE blueprint um, roadmap epigenomics, and you can limit to specific cell types as well. Um, there are pathogenicity predictions available, so you can get SIFT and Polyfen2 um, predictions of um, missense variants as well. You can also get things like mutation taster um, by adding um, plugins to, to the VET. And you can get phenotypes, diseases, clinical significance. So we will give you phenotypes from places such as OMIM, OrphanNet, GWAS Catalog, ClinVar. And we'll give you phenotypes both associated with the variant and also with the gene that's been affected. Um, so there's quite a lot of information that you can retrieve. Um, I said the word plugins earlier. Plugins are ways to add extra functionality to the VEP. So the VEP does a lot of stuff by itself, but it also allows you to, to add extra stuff on. Um, it may allow you to filter the data or manipulate um, the output. And because these give quite extensive and um, extra annotation, that we kind of make them extras that you, you plug in rather than part of the, the default, or it's become very slow and very unwieldy for everybody. Um, they may make use of external data and code. Um, now, the VEP is available via a web interface, um, which I'm going to show you today. It's a point and click, and it suits kind of small volumes of data. If you've got less than, say, a thousand variants, um, the web interface is, is quite a nice, easy way to, to analyze them. There is a, a standalone um, offline tool. Um, if you've got something like whole genome data, I would recommend using this, this standalone um, tool. This has a lot more flexibility, a lot more options. And there's also a REST API. If you want to um, incorporate VEP into a pipeline or something, um, or get something to display on a web page, there's loads of people who embed um, our REST API endpoints into their web pages so you can have um, information about a gene and then about a variant and then immediately get the, the gene data. Um, we talked, Joanella talked a lot about MAIN, um, and while MAIN is available in Ensemble, it's unfortunately not yet available in the online tool um, for, um, for the VEP, but it is coming very soon. We're expecting it in um, Ensemble 98, which we're hoping by the end of the month. If you are using the offline tool, you can um, get the MAIN transcripts in your, your VEP output, so that will allow you to do things um, like filter to say, I only want to see um, effect on the main, although of course this won't get you something for, for every single gene, or you can just sort of highlight this in, in your output. Um, and it will allow you to see the matching NMs. So if you're using the online tool, you can use it like main is defined. The filters for the offline are a bit more complicated. So I'm gonna do a quick demo using the, the online tool of the VEP, um, putting in a set of four variants to find out what genes they hit and what effect they have on them. So hopefully everything will be, be kind to me and work as it ought to. So I'm just going to copy this list and I'm going to um, the Ensemble Genome Browser. Is that big enough or shall I zoom in a wee bit? Sorry. I'm going to zoom. I'm being advised by my colleagues mm -hmm. to zoom. Um, so I'm going to click on VEP um, here in the top blue bar. And here you can see I've got all the information about the web interface, the command line tool, um, links to documentation and things. So if I did want to go command line, I can find out about it here. But I'm going to click launch VEP to go into the online version. Because um, Joanella has done some, some VEP jobs in Ensemble before, she's got a little table here. If you haven't used the VEP before, what will happen when you come in here is you'll actually be in this table, this new job form automatically, but you just click on the new job button. Um, so I'm going to give my date, my um, job a name. I'm going to call it webinar demo. And I'm just going to paste my data into this, into this input box. I can also link, provide a file. So if I've got my data um, on an FTP site or something like that, I could put a link in here or I could choose a file to, to upload. Um, it gives examples here of all the different possible um, data types that you could use. So if I just click on these, you'll see that it just shows me some example data. So I'm not sure what my data ought to look like. I can check those. I'll just get rid of that and go back to my, my data. And um, 
it's going to choose which which database I want to analyze against. So I can analyze against the Ensemble um, GenCode transcripts if I wanted to use RefSeq instead. That's an option, and I can actually do um, both. I think in this example, I'm going to go with both. So it's going to these are normally collapsed, but because Journal has used it before, they are expanded. Um, but you can see I can get things like gene symbol, transcript version. Um, I'm going to tick HGBS because a lot of people like to use HGBS um, notation for, for variant reporting. So I'm going to select that. It's going to find me known um, co-located variants and find me frequency data um, from 1,000 genomes. It's going to get me PubMed IDs for these co-located variants. If I expand out some more of these, um, this is where we will eventually see the main option. Um, so you can get that. It's not there at the moment. I'm going to tick phenotypes because this can give me this gives me information about both the phenotypes affected by the gene um, and also by the the um, by the variant. If I open up predictions, you'll see I've got um, SIFT and polyphen. Um, predictions and scores, but there are other options that I could have as well. I could do splicing predictions, um, conservation scores and things like that. I can also filter the data at this stage because I've only put in four variants, I'm not going to, but you could do things if I'll just show you. I can um, filter to show um, things based on their minor allele frequency, um, which I can choose and I can go higher or lower and I can choose which population that's in. I'm going to go back to my no filtering um, and then I'm going to hit run. So this is currently saying it's it's queued um, and so it will refresh every 10 seconds with my job. Um, so it's now it's saying it's running and then eventually it will give me this green um, done button and I'll be able to view my results. And it's run nice and quickly. So I'm going to hit view results. And you can see I've processed four variants. None of them have been filtered. One of them was novel. Three of them um, were existing and I've overlapped four genes, 14 transcripts and one regulatory feature. And I've got a sort of summary of the consequences here. If I go down to my table, um, you can see I've got lists of the genes that are affected and the transcripts. So you can see that the genes, um, I've got repeats here, so I've got the ensemble ENSGs, and then I've got the um, NCBI gene um, numbers here. If I scroll across, you'll see that, um, can't get the scrolling to work on Joanella's computer. Ah, there we go. Um, I can see that where I've got the NCBI gene IDs, I've got the NCBI NM transcripts and where I've got the ENSGs, I've got the ENST um, transcripts. So I can see that this particular variant, this um, VAR2, whoops, I accidentally went back. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry. This is what happens when you use somebody else's computer. It's slightly different <laughs> to your own. And she's got her two finger scroll set up the opposite way to how I have. Um, so you can see the biotypes of these, of these, um, of the the transcripts, where I've, um, where it falls within the coding regions. I've got these um, HGBS notation. I can see the position within the cDNA. I can see the amino acid change um, and the codons. What I'm just going to do is I'm just going to do a filter on this. So you can see at the top here I've got filters. I'm going to filter by missense because there are some extra bits that you'll see with a missense variant. Rather than try and scroll down and search for one, it's easier to just um, find them. Okay, so this case, we've got this missense variant. We can see um, we've got the amino acid chain. So we've got HTBSC, which is HTBS in terms of the, the transcript, and we've got HTBSP, which is in terms of the protein. So we can see the protein change there we've got the position, the change in the amino acid, the change in the codon. This is a known variant in the database, so it's it's found it for me. Um, and that's a link and I could go and explore more. Um, I can see the SIFT and polyphen scores for these missense variants um, listed here. And over here, right at the end, is my phenotype data. 
Um, so you can see that they're associated phenotypes with the genes. Um, for some um, variants you'll also see, and it tells you the genes, so you know that that's what you're looking at. You can also see associated phenotypes um, with the, the um, variants. There is a lot more data that, that can be um, displayed. I'm not going to go through every column in detail because that would just be um, a bit silly. But as you can see, there's a lot of data that you can use. I showed you one of the filters already. So you can filter by things like allele frequency of known variants and, and, and various kinds of data like that in order to kind of narrow down on the transcripts um, and the variants that might be most important and most interesting to you. So this can be a really um, useful tool for, for understanding clinical variation data. So I'm just going to finish off by talking about my favourite topics, um, which are health and documentation. Um, if you want to, to find any kind of online courses and things to do with Ensemble, um, we have training courses online. Um, please do go to these links. EBI Train Online has got loads and loads of different kinds of training courses, and we've got further ones just in Ensemble. We have our own YouTube channel on top of the one that EBI Training have um, with loads and loads of videos. And if you're stuck on anything, you can email us. We are helpdesk at ensemble.org. You can follow us on social media um, for announcements about things um, like where we're up to with, with the main, um, like how we're actually processing. We're writing quite a few blogs. Um, on our, on our blogs, we've got a WordPress there that describes um, what we're actually doing with things like Maine. You can go on there and there are also opportunities to kind of join up and, and get involved in things like um, usability testing. Jo and Ella mentioned it in terms of TARC, but it's available in, um, we, we are keen to find people who want to work, um, want to try out um, our, our interfaces and we're doing a lot of development and stuff. If you would like to have a course um, in person, we can come to you. Um, in high income countries, we ask for trainers expenses. In low to middle income countries, we have a grant that can pay for this. We have courses aimed at wet lab scientists, um, REST API courses, which are aimed more at bioinformaticians. And we can also train um, trainers to deliver um, Ensemble browser courses. Please do send us an email or take a look at our training.ensemble.org. Um, website to find out more about these courses. Um, these are some of the relevant publications to the things that, that I've mentioned. So um, if you use Ensemble at all, please do reference the, um, the nucleic acid research. We put out uh, an annual paper there. So the most recent one was um, Cunningham et al. Um, from 2019. If you use the VEP at all, there's a paper from um, Will McLaren who is the original author of the VET. There's also a paper talking about how our annotation system, the, man, the automatic annotation system works. And there's another paper from GenCode um, talking more about what the GenCode um, consortium does and how the, the human and mouse genomes are annotated. This is kind of Ensemble and Friends um, at our latest um, retreat, which was last summer. Um, and these are, are everyone who, who works um, in Ensemble and all our, our funders to whom we are incredibly grateful. And this is um, all the people who work on Gen Code. Um, so there's people within Ensemble Havana, um, within TGMI, um, but also people um, in the Gen Code Consortium who are outside um, of, of the EBI as well um, who contribute to this. If you are interested in um, more webinars and more training from the EBI, um, these are run every couple of weeks. Please do check out um, the EBI training website. Um, but you'll also find online training, um, physical in-person training that you can attend as well. Um, so it's really worth taking a look if you haven't um, explored that much before. Um, and there will be a survey that launches after this webinar. So please do fill that in um, so we can find out if if this webinar was useful and if you want more things like this um, in future. So um, that's everything I wanted to say. Do we have any questions? Um, oh, we've got loads of questions. No, I think. Okay, so we have a question about the VEP input. If you search for a position, are you supposed to add plus forward according to the strand? Okay, yes. So 
for the most part, VEP will assume if you don't include any information about the strand, VEP will assume that the alleles you're using are the forward strand alleles. Now, obviously, variants affect both, um, both strands of, of the genome. Um, if you don't say it will assume forward strand, if you have actually used the alleles from the reverse strand, then yes, you should input um, the alleles. So the ensemble de the strand, the ensemble default format has a column um, for a plus or minus to allow you to input this. Um, but the other formats like VCF, um, VCF is always forward strand. That's that's the rules of VCF, and I believe that that Speedy is the same um, as well. Um, and are the var one, two, three, whatever make it easy to read the results. Yes, so that's a column um, for the variant identifier. It can be a real variant identifier, like a proper RS or Cosmic or something ID. It can just be something you've made up. In the example I gave, that was something I made up. Um, and it just makes it easier to see what's what in your results. Um, right, the column for feature strand. Okay, the feature strand, um, let's go back to the VEP results. So the feature strand is actually telling you um, the strand of this feature. So where we've got um, this ensemble transcript, feature strand tells me that, um, where is the feature strand in this particular one? Feature strand one. So this is telling me that um, this transcript, ENST, blah, 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 300452 is on the forward strand. So it's the, it's the strand of, the thing that it's hit as opposed to the strand of the variant because of course variants don't have strand um, if you input a negative strand variant it would just that just reflects what it will take with the alleles it will still compare to both strands of the genome um was there anything else that i've missed this one but i think I, oh question just came in okay oh no that's not a question uh for clinical diagnosis what's your optimal method to, to filter VCF files. So this depends whether we're, if we're talking, so big, big um, caveat, um, we are not a clinical diagnosis tool. We do not have any kind of FDA um, approval. Everything should be checked and balanced further to, to anything you do. Um, we do not take responsibility if you misdiagnose somebody. Um, we expect you to use your clinical um, expertise in this case. If I were looking for a variant that was causal for a rare disease, there are loads and loads of different things um, I would take into account. So a major thing I would take into account um, would be um, would be a consequence type. So um, I would be looking for loss of function um, variants and missense variants. So I'd probably exclude intron variants um, five prime UTR variants, um, non-coding uh, transcript variants, all of those would probably um, be excluded if you're looking for rare Mendelian disease. Um, if you're looking at things like GWAS, totally different um, perspective. I would then consider things like um, variant frequency. So the thousand genomes um, data and the nomad data are these sort of large scale um, variation studies, population variation studies, you would expect um, a variant which is causal for a, um, a rare disease to be very low frequency or not even ever observed in, in, these, um, in these projects. So I would filter by variant frequency. Actually, the best advice, rather than um, say this, I'm just going to go back to the VEP documentation and there's actually a tool that we have, there's a plugin um, that's been uh, created for the VEP, which was a, um, a collaboration um, with, um, it's gonna take me a moment to, to remember who, uh, Decipher um, worked on this with us and it is called um, the G2P plugin, uh, which stands for genotype to phenotype. Um, so the genotype to phenotype plugin um, uses a list which was um, compiled by groups. So there's a, um, a list that you can get that was um, compiled by the DDD project, which um, lists genes which are known to be involved in um, clinical rare disease phenotypes. 
um, and list the allelic requirement of these. So whether um, they can, it needs to be um, needs to be homozygous, or if it could be heterozygous to, to cause this particular disease. Um, and then um, what you can do is you can input, you can use this with the vet. And it gives you this output as an HTML file. And it does a load of filtering. So it filters by allele frequency. It filters by um, by um, the thing that I mentioned, uh, variant consequences. And it also um, does this filter by um, by the allelic requirement. So if, if a gene has an allelic requirement for, for being um, homozygous, it uses your phased genotype um, to determine whether both copies of the gene have got um, a, a variant uh, with a with a loss of function consequence in um, that would um, that would give you this. So the genotype, the um, G to P plugin, the gene to phenotype plugin does what you need it to do for that kind of filtering. But even if you don't want to use the plugin, it's worth like taking a look at the documentation that that goes with it. So this isn't. Um, particularly informative, but if I oops, click on the link here, it takes me to a GitHub, which is quite involved, um, but there are some links um, within it that give you some, some description. So um, here we go, here's the link we want. This tells you, I'll just pop that in the chat box. Um, so this gives you a description of, of how this works, um, who's involved, and some of the things that are are um, involved, so you can get um, documentation and things. But what they use in the genotype to phenotype, the gene to phenotype um, plugin, is what I would use to to filter for rare disease. Was there anything else? No, then, cool. Thank you very much for for attending the webinar. Um, do you have anything else to say, Joe? No, just thank you for your attention and please do contact us if there are any additional questions or, or if you want to test anything, let us know.